Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Happy Sabbath. We are going to be looking at some items presented by Sister White in conjunction with what we've been studying these last several Sabbaths. So shall, <clears throat> shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and thank him for this blessing so that we may learn more of that which we need to understand at this time in Earth's history. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for another Sabbath, a time of rest, a time that we may come to you to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us now, Father, and guide us as we open your word. May we be able to understand that which you would have us to know at this time. Direct us now, Father. May your spirit attend us. May your angels surround us, surround us each one, so that we may more clearly understand that which we are learning. We need you, especially at this time. For our minds need to be opened. They have been darkened through many years of sin. We need you to show us, Father, and give us strength to walk on the path that you are setting before us. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this blessing. And ask, Father, that we may become the type of people that may more per purposely and correctly represent your character to this earth. For this, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Can, uh, can someone tell me what the subject and main point of the last several Sabbaths morning studies has been? Not finding fault with others and looking for for things to pick on with people or pick at. Not finding fault, not criticizing, right? Yes. Definitely. Okay. Now, I'm going to say two words, and this is going to be a linchpin of today's study. But it is also going to be something for us to need to consider. Those two words are pay attention. We're going to read a letter. It's a short letter because I did not copy it all. That was written to <coughs> E.W. Shortridge. Brother Shortridge, October 25, I was shown in vision that the truth had not had its sanctifying influence upon your heart. And there has not been that reform in you, which was necessary in order for you to be a successful laborer in the gospel field. It is a most solemn, important work to present the last message of mercy to the world and to bear a testimony, which is to prove a savor of life unto life or of death unto death. I was shown that it was of the highest importance for those who bear this message to be right and to be in samples to the flock. In the first vision given me for you before I had seen you, I was shown that you were capable of doing good, but you had much to learn. And if thoroughly converted to the truth, you could present the arguments of our position in a clear, pointed manner. I was shown that there was much chaff introduced into your preaching that God had nothing to do with and which grieved his Holy Spirit. You must be, as I expressed to you, torn all to pieces and made over new. 
for that preaching which was acceptable in your former labors would not be acceptable to God or do good in this last solemn message. Your trifling expressions and gestures must be, enti must be entirely put away and you realize the tendency and evil of them or your labors will prove a curse instead of a blessing. In the last vision given October 25, I saw that your labors, your life and conversation have not taken that elevated character, which is in keeping with the message you bear. <coughs> you put on a dignity which is not objectionable if you would carry it out in your life and maintain a true godly dignity, especially in the pulpit. Many of your expressions, figures, and gestures are not dignified in the sight of heaven, of angels, or of Christ's devoted followers. With some, you excite mirthfulness and disgust with others. If deep conviction of truth rests upon minds, and they feel <clears throat> that vital importance is attached to the decisions they make, your presenting solemn truths in such a trifling manner banishes the solemn impressions that truth has made and the scale turns and decisions are made on the wrong side. Angels are grieved and turn from you in displeasure and the record is made in heaven of your sin for thus heaven regards it. Angels are grieved. Who else is grieved? Two words, pay attention. Who else is grieved by the way that these presentations are being made? Christ. Do we also not see just in the paragraph above that in these presentations, the manner in which they are presented have grieved the Holy Spirit? Yeah, the Holy Spirit is grieved. So if the Holy Spirit is grieved, is Christ not grieved and is God the Father not grieved? Yes. And can we not say that if they are grieved and the angels are grieved, that all of heaven is grieved? <clears throat> yes. Okay. God requires his servants who labor for the salvation of souls to be in samples to the flock and unfaithfulness on their part <clears throat> is regarded by heaven as a high crime and will be visited with God's anger. What does that say to us today? We have to work. If we have leaders that are not willing to live according to God's law and instruction. Are they not being unfaithful? <clears throat> and in <clears throat> is this not then seen by a high crime by heaven? That's what it said. Okay. Earthly conflicts and battles were presented before me. No one is allowed to fill the place of officer unless he has been proved. And confidence could be placed in his integrity, his skill, his bearing, and his ability. He must lead the company placed under his command. And by his own example, inspire them with the same spirit which animates him 
Should these officers be detected in unfaithfulness? If they do not suffer death, they are immediately removed and another is placed in their stead. Then I saw how much more important were the battles in which we are engaged. And the burden of this work is committed to ministers. They are overseers of the flock. Please read Acts 20:28. 20, <clears throat> Take heed thereof unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Who are to be the ministers? Does this mean we need to have a doctor of divinity degree from a worldly university? Who are the ministers for the flock for this day? We are. Exactly. If we are not willing to stand as ministers, if we are not willing to stand and give the trumpet a certain sound, how can we ever expect to hear the words of Christ, well done, thou good and faithful servant? The people look to ministers and imitate their example, and they are responsible to God for the influence they exert. They must render an account to God for their words and acts. Now, the funny thing that I found about this document, words and acts in this sentence were italicized as this was published. We must render an account to God for our words and for our acts. If they are unskillful workmen, they have mistaken their calling. The lives of the holy apostles were presented before me. They were in samples. And it was safe for the flock to follow them. I was shown that while you could present some points of truth clearly, you lack personal piety and humility. Your former associates, your former associations and labors have led you to rely upon your own sufficiency instead of depending at all times upon God for strength. Since you embraced the third angel's message, you have not realized that unless God's special power attends this message, your labors are in vain. Now, let's keep this in mind. This brother to whom this letter was written had embraced the third angel's message. If we were paying attention, we saw the date in which this letter was written. When had this brother embraced the third angel's message? Okay, when had the four, when had the first the third angel's message arrived? We've studied this many times. We understand. Eighty eight, wasn't it? It, it was what. Wasn't it in 88 or 84 or something in that nature? No. 
October 22, 1844. That's the third angel's message? Third angel's message arrived October 22nd, 1844. Arrived. Thank you. <clears throat> and the three steps with these messages are arrived, formalized, and empowered. This brother embraced the third angel's message. And when is Ellen White writing this letter to this brother? I don't know. I can't see the date. Sorry. No, no, no. This is why the first two words I said that we're going to use as a linchpin today were what? Pay attention. This is oh. not a criticism. No, no, but my memory is uh, is oftentimes notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, understood. Since you embrace the third angel's message, you have not realized that unless God's special power attends this message, your labors are in vain. This message is for the movement today. This message, and I'm going to roll right back to it, and we're going to come back to the finish this paragraph. August 19th, 1862. This was from a vision of October 25th, 1861. Before the church was fully set up, E.W. Shortridge had chosen to accept the third angel's message. In 1861 and in 1862, it is apparent that he was attempting to preach the third angel's message. This is well before 1886 or 1888. Just, just a note on this, because um, back in, I don't know when this was, uh, well, the early 2000s. Um, right. I, I used to do a paper. It was called the Warburg News. Um, and, uh, you know, this issue of jesting and joking, the role of humor came up. Right. And so I did some research and study on it. And this is some of the passages that I had studied were these from, uh, I think it's in Testimonies, Volume 3, that she wrote this letter to Brother Shortridge. <clears throat> Um, and, and I had known of a pastor, um, and I'm trying to think who the pastor was at the time. I think, well, we did have a pastor. His dad had been a pastor, and he would always start off every sermon with a joke. It had nothing to do with anything. Um, it was just, you know, that was, he was just known as a joking kind of pastor. So anyway, I did a lot of research on this study on, on humor and the role of humor. Um, and this jesting and joking obviously is, is not uh, something that should happen from the pulpit. But even just in, in our own personal life, um, we can do lots of damage with, with humor. Now, there is a, role, a place for humor. I mean, there is humor in the Bible. Ellen White used humor. God uses humor. But it's a different type of humor. And... Um, I did a study on this at that time. I was at this old encyclopedia, I think it was Collier's Encyclopedia. And there was a whole article on humor. And, and this was an old encyclopedia from like the 1920s or something like that. And his view was that all humor was making fun of other people. Okay. Right. So, um, and I think to a large degree, that's what humor is there is a type of humor that isn't but it's kind of a it's it's sort of a um it's kind of hard to explain without going into it but there's just a humor of of situation and and it's and it's a good healthy humor but it's not the type of humor where you make jokes and jest and and put other people down and stuff like that so 
but even even inside humor can be a type of uh, um, you know that somebody is excluded from that humor. It's it's also a way of laughing at others. So we have to be quite careful about it. Anyway, that's just my thoughts on this. Okay. Now, <clears throat> one thing about this particular letter, Mrs. White allowed this to be published in the Review and Herald on August 19th, 1862. So this letter was being given as an admonition, not just to Brother Shortridge, but to all of the believers at that time. This situation is one that is very pointed. It is very direct because if we are going to attempt <clears throat> to present the message of the third angel, we must understand that we are standing not in front of other of God's creation, but we are also standing in front of all of God's creation. Angels, heaven, along with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Since you embrace the third angel's message, you have not realized that unless God's special power attends this message, your labors are in vain. You have too exalted an opinion of yourself. The success of this message does not depend upon those who are called smart men. God can raise up men and fit them to carry this message in the power and the spirit. Although they are lowly, yet in humble obedience, they will learn of God and receive counsel of him. I was shown that you have but little experience in this, your new work. In your former manner of preaching, you could pass along with a superficial work, and it would pass off well. Not so in this solemn message. God requires of his ministers purity of soul, holiness of heart and of life, constant watchfulness, and almost unceasing prayer. This is the instruction that we are given in order to give the third angel's message. All your boasting, jesting, joking, and foolish talking must be laid aside, and you earnestly seek the grace of God that you may overcome these evils, which destroy your influence. God will not bear with your folly unless you can exert a holy influence and be a strong example to those for whom you labor, you had better cease laboring to win souls for, to Christ, for they follow your example and entirely fail to come up to God's requirements. You feel that your testimony is crippled, that your brethren take too rigid a course with you. But when you are converted to this message, you will be a free man in the pulpit. You will not feel under restraint. From the cleansed fountain will proceed only pure sweet water. Your brethren are none too particular. God is particular. And his angels who are sent forth to do his will are grieved with your lack of spirituality, of pureness, and godliness. You must bring yourself under strict discipline and reform in life, or your labors will prove a curse instead of a blessing. <clears throat> Mrs. White cared for this brother and for those that had heard the message that he was presenting. In this situation, she is warning him 
that he was grieving the angels, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and Christ. May this not be said of us. Manuscript 32, 1890, the source of the church's power. This manuscript had not been published on its own, but was published in H.M. And what is H.M.? I don't know what H.M. is. Okay. Okay. Uh Somebody might know. I, I do have a point about the previous letter. Okay, go ahead. I find kind of interesting. So, um, well, the date uh, the date for the article is variously dated. It's uh, sometimes said August 1st, 1862. But <clears throat> I think they didn't really date the, uh, the Review and Herald at that time to a specific date. It was just right. put up in a month. Um, but she wrote the letter, it's dated November 22nd, 1861. So, so she had the vision on October 25th, 1861. She wrote this letter November 22nd, 1861. And when they published it, they published it with his name, which I find interesting to actually uh, name the person uh, specifically. Well, I, I was intrigued. I mean, I, I looked at the, the days between the dates from October 25, 1861 to August 19th. And 18th. there was yeah. of 1862, right? Yeah. There's 298 days. So if this, if this was actually three days later, we would have either 200 or 201 days. Three days later, I have August 1st. Oh, you have August 1st? Okay, that's 18. And then it was, it was written November 22nd, 1861 is when she wrote the letter. Okay. So um, if I put that in here, 1861, November 22. And then it's going to be published in August on Um, if you go, if you take the August 1st date, right, uh, from the November 22nd date, it's 252 days. But, wow. But yeah, so there's different dates given for the publication. Uh, no, uh, the 19th is the other date given. So <clears throat> anyway. Okay. Said, no some <clears throat> observations. Thank you to two brothers from the chat. <clears throat> HM is the home missionary. But for this letter to have had a span of 252 days, that's um, intriguing, especially with what all we've been studying recently. Yeah, intriguing to say the least. Yes. Manuscript 32, 1890. Now, this is a very short manuscript. Brethren, we must have less of self and more of God. We are not to trust for success to what we can do, but to what Christ can do through our efforts. <clears throat> the efficiency of our labors depend upon our hold upon God. The Lord requires of you diligent culture of your abilities. Unless you are constantly in Christ's school, the, last, the tastes and aspirations will become earthly, and the energies entrusted to you for the accomplishment of God's work will be perverted and misplaced. The Holy Spirit is grieved and driven away by the self-sufficiency, the unchristlike spirit that is cherished. Consider this statement for a moment. In the last letter, 
in 1862, Mrs. White was being very clear that this brother who was presenting what he thought was the third angel's message was grieving the Holy Spirit. In this manuscript, the statement is made that the Holy Spirit is grieved and driven away by the self-sufficiency, the unchristlike spirit that is cherished. Do we wish to find out <clears throat> at the second resurrection that we chose to grieve and drive away the Holy Spirit? Or do we wish to stand when Christ comes and be accepted by him? You have no time to spend in contention. Draw near to God and go to work for Christ and the souls that he died to save. If mistakes are made as they will be, do not fail. Do not fall back, content to make no further effort, but try again. With agony of desire and humility, with wrestling faith, come to one who is too wise to err, who will make no mistake in your case, one who knows your every weakness, and one who will hear your heartfelt prayers. May God make his servants wise through the divine illumination that the mold of every man may not be seen on any of the great and important enterprises before us. <clears throat> we are not to hold on to a self-sufficient, I am always right type of attitude. We are to rely upon Christ alone. The Lord wants us to come up to the mount more directly into his presence. Who was it that came up into the mount? Can you give me examples of those that came up into the mount, into the presence of God? Uh, Moses, Abraham, Moses, um, who else? Uh, Jacob, um, John, uh, there's quite a few. I mean, Ezekiel, um, there's quite a few. Did not Elijah come up into the mount? Oh, yeah, Elijah came up. I'm sorry. That, that's who I actually was focusing on and didn't even say him. <laughs> we are coming to a crisis <clears throat> which more than any precious time since the world began will demand the entire consecration of every faculty of the mind and every power of the being on the part of all who have named the name of Christ. She understands the crisis that is yet before us. <clears throat> In order to survive through this crisis, this demands our entire consecration of every faculty of the mind and every power of the being. <clears throat> It is through the church that the self-sacrificing love of Jesus is to be made manifest to the world. But the present example of the church, the character of Christ is, is misrepresented and a false conception of him is given to the world. So let us change one word. Let us consider this carefully.
It is through the movement that the self-sacrificing love of Jesus is to be made manifest to the world. But by the present example of the movement, the character of Christ is misrepresented and a false conception of him is given to the world. Self-love excludes the love of Jesus from the soul. And this is why there is not in the movement greater zeal and more fervent love for him who first loved us. Self is supreme in so many hearts. <clears throat> their thoughts, their time, their money are given to self-gratification. While souls for whom Christ died are perishing. If we are choosing to remain critical of others, if we are choosing to exclude others, if we are choosing not to seek the words that may be given to help others understand the time in which we live so that we may more properly present the messages of Revelation 14. Then we are ignoring the souls for whom Christ died. And we are allowing them to perish. This is why the Lord cannot impart to his movement the fullness of his blessing. <clears throat> to honor them in a distinguished manner before the world would be to put his seal upon their works, confirming their false representation of his character. When the church shall come out from the world and be separate from its maxims, its habits, and its practice, the Lord Jesus will work with his people. He will pour a large measure of his spirit upon them, and the world will know that the Father loves them. Will the people of God continue to be stupefied with selfishness? We are being called out from the world. We are to hold ourselves as separate from the world's maxims, from the world's habits, and the world's practices. <clears throat> In this movement, we are not to be critical of others. We are not to have a self-righteous spirit. If we don't understand that, then we are no better than those that have already left this movement. Um, I just have some other observations. <clears throat> so this brother Shortridge, um, on there's a Review and Herald uh, special that's published on August 26th, okay. 1862. And um, it's a record of the meeting that they had, um, basically to remove him from being a minister. Okay. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> now, just to deal with the chronology of this. So Ellen White has this vision about Brother Shortridge Council <laughs> on October 25th, 1861. And so, it's going to be four weeks later that she writes the letter out. So November 22nd, 1861. So 28 days, which right. of course we know that that's a symbol of the seven times. Right? Correct. Now then we have a publication date of August 1st, 1862, whether that's the correct publication date or not. That's the way it is in the United States and also on the E.G. White disc. And that's 252 days after she writes it out. <laughs> then um, 18 days later is the publication date you have. 
And then seven days later is the special in which his ministerial credentials are removed. So you got an 18 and a seven there as well. Or one, eight, seven. Yeah. So that's, that's se seven different signs that you yeah. came across? Yeah, pretty yes. much. <laughs> um, incredible. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Interesting, to say the least. Now, now that's not the end of it. The, no. name, <laughs> the name Shortridge itself um, is, is the surname. It, it comes from uh, Old English. Uh, so the word scorri erud, erud. So it, it means somebody of short counsel. Wow. And when you look at, at, at uh, the record of why they removed his credentials, uh, he, was, he had been uh, personally hurt by, by others um, because of his character. They were uh, you know, not supporting him financially because prior to that, uh, financial support just came from individuals. And so he started attacking this other brother and misrepresenting him and trying to get him removed. So in, in the end, he ends up getting removed as a minister. So it, it's quite an interesting read. The, it's just a two-page uh, uh, Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald special. But uh, yeah, it's quite interesting uh, to see basically the type of characteristics that, that we've seen happen before. Uh, in this movement, sort of jealousies and misrepresentation of people's characters. So um, can I ask a question here? Certainly. Was the, was the publishing of that information in that special um, okay for the church to do? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. I just wanted to know because... Um, <laughs> Me and you have to have a couple of little discussions privately. Over what's been going on here. I mean, um, what went on in the last couple of sab uh, um, church meetings that I attended. Uh, it was kind of like an after hours thing. You know, they have like a free form discussion. Yeah. So I would like to discuss some things about that with you, but I don't, well, I, don't know. Your time. I don't know if it would be needful. Uh, I don't know if it's needful to discuss. What that, it, 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 that's exactly what I was, why yeah. I you know, don't want to talk about this. I just, no, but I'm just saying, I don't, think, I, I don't think it's ever really needful. Um, so, but here in this situation, they had, a brother who was doing damage to the cause. Ellen White received the vision, uh, gave him some counsel. The counsel was obviously ignored because um, 252 days later, uh, she's going to publish that counsel in the Review and Herald, right? Right. Uh, with his name attached to it. And then... Um, and then uh, 25 days later, his, his credentials are going to be, well, the publication of his credentials being removed, that they're not going to support him any longer as a minister. So, you know, so there's a proper process that's been gone through in order for this to occur. Right. Um, but I don't think it's a good idea to talk about other people, even, even, even when, you know, it's, it's justifiable in the sense that, you know, people are saying certain things or doing certain things for us as individuals, right, to do that. that that's my view. I don't think it helps the cause. Any. No, I know it doesn't. I mean, I can, I can see it. Exactly. So, so I wouldn't, you know, go about, uh, you know, talking about what other people said about somebody or anything like that. I don't think it, it I don't think it's helpful. That's, that's my understanding of it. That would be going against the counsel that we're really being given. We need to represent Christ 
Now, the fact that they were were doing this is is because the church paper there, that's the official church paper paper. That's how people would know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're not going to be giving money to uh, Brother Shortridge anymore. You're not going to be supporting him because the movement isn't supporting it because at that time they're not yet officially a church. Okay. So I hope that's helpful. Not really. <laughs> well, it should be. Yeah, I mean, I get, I, well, no, because I'm in confusion because it, it almost parallels this whole thing that we're studying. Well, yeah. So the thing is we shouldn't, we should take this council to heart and follow it. We can't control other people. Oh, absolutely not. Not trying to. Yeah. And, and we shouldn't uh, tell other people what other people said. Right. Okay. Okay. One of the points that I will be most blunt about with this study on this Sabbath We have been going over many documents, many presentations that Mrs. White had published regarding criticizing others. And we've done that over the last several Sabbaths. The Lord led for this presentation to be put together. And there's a specific series of points that we're going to get into in just a moment. <clears throat> I have not sent this to anyone. It will be sent after the presentation. All of these presentations that I have been led to give, I view as being directed at myself more than anyone else. This has all been personal to me. I don't want anyone to feel that I am being critical of others. I am looking at this strictly and being critical of myself alone. <clears throat> And that's the only way we can ever benefit from this council. Well, I'm just making this point direct and placing it openly. And I agree, but this is, this is the reason from what I'm saying. All right. Now, the next document, October 24th, 1893 entitled, Brotherly Love Needed. The Lord and the intelligences of heaven are looking upon the church that has been favored with great light. Let us remember that this is almost 30 years after the official founding of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is written not only in reference to the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the light of the 1888 message. This is written today for the movement. For the Lord and the intelligences of heaven are looking upon the movement that has been favored with great light. If the people who have heard the truth for this time walk in the light as Christ is in the light, <clears throat> they will have the regenerating influence of the Holy Spirit. What should be our reaction to this statement? It's sad. I would have expected at least one amen to this. For is this not what we are seeking is the regenerating influence of the Holy Spirit? 
Mm -hmm. Their hearts will be softened and subdued, and they will be meek and lowly of heart like their Savior. And it can be said of them, by their fruits ye shall know them. They will love their Redeemer with supreme affection and honor all those who love him and who follow his precepts. They will not mount upon the judgment seat to judge their brother's motives and work because they will remember that Christ has bidden them, judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Do we not understand that this is the standard if we choose to judge others that is going to be enforced upon us? Can we not see this as a most fearful admonition? I am filled with sorrow as I see finite men who claim to be the sons of God, filled with evil surmising and ready to speak evil of their brethren in the truth, ready to weigh others in their own scales of human opinion and place their estimate upon those of whom they really understand but little. Are these my words or are these the words of the prophet? They're not my words. But this is a warning for us today. The worst of it is that often those who ought to understand why such action is out of place drink in the spirit of the accuser, go to the polluted fountain of suspicion and distrust, and turning from the course of judgment marks out and guided by someone's heresy of another's action of character. By this course, God's Holy Spirit is grieved. And the churches, the movement, are weakened by the influence of distrust and suspicion. For they are led to speak evil of those who stand far better in the sight of God than do their accusers. <clears throat> I stand as a witness. In the aftermath of July 18th. I was at the meeting at Future for America when there were those that were accusing, <clears throat> pointing fingers, saying this person or this person should not be allowed to speak. Where I had to listen to accusations. In these situations, these issues were written in the books of heaven. Is this the type of testimony that we wish upon our names? <clears throat> Are we to take reports, heresy, as if they were verity and truth? verity and truth are we not to rebuke the tale bearer who would make a condemned brother's course appear as bad as possible the true brethren of christ are those who guard the interests of their brethren and sisters mm -hmm. yeah and this thing of 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 hearsay so I mean, this is why, you know, I don't like to hear from others reports about what people said, especially about me, because it what it does is it creates distrust and suspicion. And and things are often taken out of context. 
and so and then aren't we supposed to be what is what does she say here are we to take reports heresy as they were verity and truth are we not to rebuke the tail bearer mm -hmm. who would condemn who make a condemned brother's course appear as bad as possible so and that's my point well so um, yeah you need so if somebody comes to me and they or I'm listening to somebody and they they start talking bad about a person. I mean, first is I'm not good. If they're talking to me personally, I'm going to say I don't want to hear it. Mm. Secondly, I would rebuke them, right? Okay. Sort of, you know, because I don't think it's profitable. Yeah, um, I told this person that it to me it was hearsay, and I don't listen to hearsay. I listen to facts. Well, but you know, also. Why is somebody condemning a brother? But I, in this, in this I, I don't understand that, how that, that we can see that as, now the first thing, you know, is we should say, have you talked to this brother? Have you tried to reconcile with them? And, and often the argument is, well, I, I haven't because this person won't listen. Or I tried, but the person won't listen. Well, then are you following the next step? Are you bringing two or three others and going to him? How much work have we done to try to reconcile with those that we are in conflict? And, and we should seek when somebody comes to us with this type of thing is, what are you doing to reconcile? What are you doing to try to understand the other person? How much do you understand uh, the other person's position? Because the reality is we hardly know anything about each other, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we can easily come to an, uh, an opinion, especially when we start listening to what other people say about someone. We can, we can form a, a view of who that person is mm -hmm. when we don't even know them. We don't even interact with them very often. My and, point we don't, and we don't know why, what, why that person is, is focused upon the supposed fault of a brother. It could be that that brother is, um, you know, under conviction and, you know, that uh, somehow, you, you know, this is a way of a defense of, of, of protecting themselves from conviction, condemning the messenger, right? So, you know, it's, I mean, this is such simple counsel. We should have learned this in kindergarten, right? <clears throat> But right you know, now, I, I was thankful I was raised in a home where we never said negative things about people. My parents never spoke ill of anyone, even when there was justifiable reasons to do so. They only spoke good of others. So that's the only example I had growing up. Um, and, and even when there are problems, we need to see that person as a valuable soul, a valuable, uh, valuable in Christ's eyes, and if we really do believe that person's in danger and we're not doing anything to help that person, then we are responsible. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't know. Well, whatever. I, I see the, all this conflict that's going on and, um, you stay, I stay silent or try to stay silent and have things, you know, pulled out of you in conversations. Um, I seen all this grief after this uh, prediction that had happened. And I'm just trying to understand what it was all from because, you know, there's been words said that, um, I particularly don't understand. Um, evidently, I wasn't a part of the camaraderie that other people enjoy. And there are things that are, 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 are not actually said, but they are alluded to. And to me, I'm a troubleshooter. That's what I do for a living. Um, <laughs> But I, I need to have all the facts in order to do any kind of diagnostics. Um, 
that's what gets me my facts is the diagnostics and that usually is asking questions to the oh. um, well the, here here in this case you're not going to get all the facts because it's not possible you can't know everything about this about these situations what's going on in people's hearts so what our responsibility to do is what ellen white is telling us to do so we stick to god's word we don't need to take sides right in this issue or anything right because this is not about camaraderie or you know who our friends are well i've always been personally it's 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 always been about um understanding what's what we are to do where we are in our uh in the lines it's okay. it's it's all about that yeah so all we need to do is follow this council we can't make anybody else follow it and we can't really decide we can't judge which person is is following it or not because we can't really know what's going on in a person's life we only see people very briefly there's a lot more that goes on in a person's life than we ever mm -hmm. know absolutely so so we need to follow this council that's all we need to do is that we don't have to know the answers to all these questions and and we need to follow the the study of the bible so we study the scriptures and we we base our beliefs upon what god leads us to study and 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 we're responsible for understanding truth for ourselves i so, agree to me to get caught up in this you know who's right and who's wrong and what's going on i don't think it's it's wise well for me it's not a matter of who's right and who's wrong because um i don't really care about that what i care about but you know what i mean i'm not talking about it, but i'm saying you need to study the truth because what it seems to me is that you know you're trying to get down to what actually happened what's causing the division right but, but you don't need to it's it's you're not going to ever find out the the whole truth you can't make decisions based upon that you can only make decisions based upon god's word and what and your relationship with God, right. trying to decide other people's place in that, I don't think is our place. Okay, that that's what I understand. I, I get that, and you know that's it's it's. I haven't wanted to say anything about this at all, but um, it's just been the last you know few days. It's been really um, trying for me. Uh, as far as this is concerned, so well, um, leave, it I, I, God's, I, leave it in God's hands. Uh, yeah, exactly. I'm, I, I'm done with this. <laughs> I mean, really, I, I'm done with this. I just want to go. To, I like being in the interaction and stuff, but I, it's hard to do it, you know, when when I'm in a defensive mode. I like I like being there. I like uh, listening to uh, the different people make their presentations. I like the interaction that goes on. You know, I, I just I just don't like the conflict. And that disturbs me and I don't want to separate myself from people because of, you know, stupid stuff like that that's what's been happening with this movement ever since I got into this movement is there's been all these different separations, you know, and it's usually because of, you know, uh, well, I, I believe what Paul says. Well, I believe what Apollo says. I believe. What... But again, this is nothing you have control over. Exactly. So even in God's hands. Exactly. And that's why not, I just listen about it wait anymore. and watch. <laughs> let's not talk about it anymore. Okay. I'm good with that. We are being brought to an upper room experience. <clears throat> there was conflict between not just a few, but all of the disciples. <clears throat> we have situations here where we are repeating the same pattern that had occurred prior to Christ's crucifixion. The only way in which 
the Spirit of God was poured out upon those disciples was that they came together and prayed together, confessed their sins to one another, and became unified. The movement at the moment is not unified. That is in the same pattern, <clears throat> in the same order as occurred before the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, yet I don't think we fully understand how prepared we are to be individually and as a movement before that outpouring can occur. The true brethren of Christ are those who guard the interests of their brethren and their sisters. How inappropriate it is to condemn others when every soul is to be saved, not by their own merits, but by the merits of a crucified and risen Savior. We are all erring, finite creatures, accountable to God for our words, for our works, and for our influence. <clears throat> Oh, that the mercy and love of God were cultivated by every member of the movement. Oh, that brotherly love might be revived, never to wane, but to grow more and more fervent. It is true that words of admonition and counsel are frequently needed within the movement. But they are never to be given by those who are filled with suspicion and distrust, who are eager to weigh others in the scales of their own opinions. Are we to apply ourselves as being the arbiter of truth? Are we to accept that of ourselves, we may see many, many tekel you farsen? Or is this of God alone? No one can do the work of reproving and counseling in the way that Christ would have it done, whose heart is not filled with peace and with love. We are near the end. There is no time to waste in educating ourselves in the line of accusation of brethren, and we are not to take up a reproach against our neighbor. Deal tenderly and graciously with every soul. Not just those that we choose, but with every soul, and especially deal tenderly with those who are liable to err. They, of all others, need your help the most. Never take up a report against a brother or a neighbor or harbor evil surmisings against him. Thou shalt not imagine evil in thy heart against thy brother. <clears throat> the powers of darkness will assault every soul, but let us not join with the evil one in his work and deal with severity to discourage and dishearten the weak and the erring. <clears throat> let us be pitiful compassionate to one another, and let an influence go out from us to heal, to bind up, to establish, rather than to wound and to uproot. There is altogether too much haste in doing what is called the square thing, and often that which we think is justice, the Lord writes in his book as oppression. Do you wish to be noted as being an oppressor of the brethren? Is this what you want written beside your name in his book of life?
The vows we take on entering the movement either mean what they say or they mean nothing. <clears throat> Consider that for a moment. Let us love one another, be kind and be courteous. Oh, how much better would we have appeared before God if we had manifested an appreciation of the labor that has been done among us. <clears throat> Those who have not had the burden of different responsibilities may look back when some mistake is apparent and say, how much better could such and such an enterprise have been carried on? But it may be that had they been placed in similar circumstances to those of the one they think erring, they might have done no better or not as well. Prejudice is a terrible thing in the sight of God. What does that mean for you? What does that mean in what we have been addressing these last several Sabbaths. It was prejudice that crucified the world's redeemer. <clears throat> Let us as a people as a movement, put away all prejudice, for it blinds the mind and makes men incapable of doing justice to those they imagine blameworthy. It will cause men to sit in judgment upon brethren whose inmost souls they cannot read, and if they could, would not understand. Instead of creating discords of judging others, we need to bind the members of our movement together by the cords of strong brotherly love in heavenly union. Is she right? Absolutely. <clears throat> if a brother is halting, it is a great sin to set his cause before the brethren in a discouraging light and let others and set others on his track, that they may discover his many frailties. <clears throat> yes, I have many frailties. This is a satanic proceeding. And although out of harmony with the spirit of Christ, all together out of harmony with the spirit of Christ. Instead of looking for faults of our brethren, let us seek for every redeeming quality to obtain his confidence, to come close to the one who needs his hands upheld, his feeble knees strengthened. Let us, brethren and sisters, make straight paths for our feet, lest the lame be turned out of the way. Instead of drawing apart, let us press together as never before, working shoulder to shoulder. There must be no discordant notes struck now. There must be no alienation. We should present to the world a united front and make it manifest that we are one in Christ Jesus, one with the brethren, bound in covenant relation, under obligation to answer the prayer of Christ to be one in him as he is one with the father. Then we can counsel together because the love of Christ is in our hearts. We can pray one for another and claim the promises of God. We could then feel secure in the love of our brethren and know that upon turning our back, we would not be stabbed with some evil report or judgment. God desires that we should have tender, sanctified regard for one another. And as dear children in his family, we need to have the pure love of Christ. Oh, shall not the seed that produces roots of bitterness and unseemly fruit be banished from our hearts? 
that we may cherish the heavenly plant of love. As mature Christians, <clears throat> we shall love more and more, not less and less. We need the warmth and the glow of Christ in our cold, stony hearts. We want our hearts broken by the love of Christ. And then we shall defend the characters of those who are giving their lives to the service of him who has died for them. We shall not then act the part of accusers and treat our brethren with their labors as worthless. Let us daily pray that we may be led to a higher plane of thought and living, that we may love in sincerity and in Christ-like deeds. How many times have we heard accusations about the character of Elder Jeff? How many times within the organized corporate church were the admonitions that Elder Jeff was giving being torn down because of his halting method of speech, because he was not as polished as those that have attended Andrews or other universities. This is just a man that spent his life in construction, but he, see, he has seen a message that needed to go to the world and committed his very life to it. I remember the time that he was here. <clears throat> he was giving presentations in Newport. I had those that I had invited to go with me. They were being told, don't listen to this man. He's wrong. He doesn't speak as Christ would speak. Yet, when we prove everything that has been said, every word, every admonition came straight from the spirit of prophecy and from the Bible. We are to watch for souls as those that must give an account. We are to be the watchmen on the wall for those souls. Instead of criticizing, pray for the deliverance from this evil habit. <clears throat> for while our time is occupied with this kind of doing, souls for whom Christ died are perishing, whom we might save. The more time that others have to criticize, is doing the work to allow others not to be saved. Whose work are we then doing? Many are starving for the bread of life, and there is no time for accusing the brethren. Rather, pray for one another that ye might be healed and go forth to seek and to save the lost and wandering sheep. Find the erring, discouraged ones by careful, diligent search, and bring them back to the fold. Christ has said, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Strive to have a real connection with Christ, and become laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Work with self hidden in Jesus, and the Lord will add to the movement such as shall be saved. The great master shepherd will give wisdom to the under shepherds, that they may become living, working agents for his use. Let them not seek to exalt themselves, but to lift up Jesus then they may go in and out and find pasture. They will then be partakers of the riches of the grace of Christ, which 
surpasseth knowledge. God cannot commit his sheep and lambs to the care of a movement who make it manifest that they have no aptitude or wisdom to care for this flock of his pasture. But this state of inefficiency need not continue, for we may have high thoughts of God's mercy and infinite love. <clears throat> Sinful and worthless creatures, though we are, through a vital connection with Christ, we yet may be renewed in knowledge and in true holiness, and thus reflect the glory and image of our Creator and our Redeemer, and be qualified to care for His sheep and His lambs. Not only have the sheep and lambs been dealt with in hardness, but even the shepherds themselves have been treated with reckless disregard. They have been spoken of in a way which shows that many in the high and lower positions have little courtesy to give to God's ordained ministers. Now, pay attention here. God's ordained ministers. Is this referring to those that are ordained by men? Or is this referring to those that are chosen and prepared by God himself? Well, it was self-defining there. It said God's ordained ministers. But that there are... There's are that, he was the one that ordained them, right? Right. Are there not many that would look upon those with their degrees from Andrews and other universities as being God's ordained ministers? A multitude would. Exactly. <clears throat> the churches themselves have been educated in such a way that they have had too little respect for those who preach the word of God. <clears throat> and who for years have given full proof of their ministry. Again, Elder Jeff. But this way of dealing with the ministers and with the members of the family of God must be changed. The blessing of God cannot rest upon those who manifest little respect for the workers together with him. My brethren, I charge you to close your ears to fault finders, to close your hearts that they may not be recipients of evil seeds of suspicion and distrust and open your hearts to the bright beams of the sun of righteousness. In the fold of Jesus Christ, the sheep and the lambs are gathered in one flock to be nourished, to be defended from the attacks of the wolves. Those who come newly into the faith are to be encouraged so that they have confidence in the ministers who walk worthily before the flock of God. They are to be fed with the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. We are waiting for the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. This faith distinguishes us from all other denominations. And as those who wait for the Lord, let us put on, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. <clears throat> if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so do ye. And above all these things, put on charity which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. We are coming close to the close of today's time together.
we are being given an admonition that rather than criticizing, we are to love our brothers and our sisters as Christ has first loved us. That we are to believe the best in them. That we are to believe the best in all. So that we can be as one body, one fold, <clears throat> one movement to give this message. This message of Revelation 14 and 18 to this very world. Any other comments or thoughts at this time? Shall we then close? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these admonitions, for these reminders <clears throat> of this that we need to understand. For this must first be a personal work before this can become a united work. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our fault findings. Forgive us for the gossip, for the slander, whether expressed or thought. Guide us now, direct us, so that that which we do today may be a representative of your character and all that you would have us to understand. Help us now as we go forward, that we may seek you in spirit and in truth, <clears throat> and to do that which you would set before us. For this we thank you and this we praise you, now and always, in Jesus' name. Amen.